will be brought to account and justice for their crimes. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this resolution. Thank you, Madam President. And I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
The Senator from Washington. Thank you, Madam President. I ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. This Saturday, Madam President, marks the 50th anniversary of Seattle's World's Fair. And the fair is a really a presentation of what the world would be like in the 21st century. The Space Needle was built, and it gave us an iconic symbol that still lasts and defines our skyline today. More than 9 million people visited that World's Fair in 1962. Elvis Presley stopped by during a film of a movie because the movie was called It All Happened at the World's Fair. And all the visitors saw a very futuristic uh, rendition of what boundless energy and innovative spirit in America would be all about. President Kennedy opened the fair highlighting the innovation in science and technology and said that these accomplishments are a bridge which will carry us confidently towards the 21st century. Indeed, the World's Fair was a bridge to the 21st century, especially for our Washington state economy. The fair foreshadowed that Puget Sound and the entire state as a region would look to innovation and entrepreneurship. The Seattle Fair gave the public a glimpse of what life would be like in the 21st century. And in the following years, Washington State was home to many of the innovations and technologies that revolutionized the way we live and work. In 1962, Seattle was home to the first satellite transmission of telephone calls and television broadcasts. That same year, the Seattle Times declared Boeing is a space age company to stay. And the rest of the, the, rest of the changes that we've continued to see have led to many things, including Boeing 787 Dreamliner that is a 21st century plane. Also, it helped uh, in setting a tone. Bill Gates took his company from his parents' house in, uh, to a global headquarters in Redmond, Washington. It was a company that was founded in 1975. And after opening its first store in 1963, Costco's became one of the first companies to ever go from zero to three billion in sales in just under six years. Amazon revolutionized the way people shop online, and it is a company that has continued to make innovations. And today, many other companies in Washington state, from everything from composites for airlines, to lean manufacturing, to mobile apps, to software, to clean energy technology, companies are continuing to innovate and to make sure that we have a talented workforce to carry out those. So 50 years ago, the World's Fair and what was announced there made sure that the United States was poised for big things to come. Some of the predictions that we saw about life in the 21st century may not have come true yet, things like flying cars, although I just recently saw an article uh, about flying cars, so maybe they weren't too far off. But other things were right on as they predict that one day you'll be able to have a telephone in your pocket. Fifty years later, we look back and see a glimpse of the 21st century in the exhibitions and the booths that were at the World's Fair. But we also see how fast the future can really come and what we need to do to keep moving forward, not just in Washington State, and, but here in the country in an innovation economy. I thank the uh, President. I yield the floor. And I suggest the absence of the quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Acock.
Madam President. Senator from Illinois. Ask consent the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Consent to speak in morning business. Without objection. Madam President, today I'm announcing the Fairness in Federal Disaster Declaration Act. I'm introducing it on behalf of myself and my colleague, Senator Mark Kirk. What we're trying to achieve here is fairness in FEMA's consideration of whether or not a community will be granted federal assistance after a disaster. I think this legislation is essential because of what just happened in my state. From 2007 to 2011, Illinois was denied federal assistance three times. Texas was denied nine times for damage caused by everything from wildfires to tropical storms. California was denied five times during that five-year period. Florida, four times, including for damage from Hurricane Ike. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, in my home state of Illinois, the communities of Harrisburg and Ridgeway were denied. Madam President, this is the damage which I saw when I went down to Harrisburg, Illinois after a recent tornado. This was a shopping mall, but it was virtually collapsed by winds of 175 mile an hour intensity. That's the second highest intensity of recorded winds in a tornado. This property damage, of course, is just a minor part of what actually happened. The major part was the loss of life. Seven people killed as a result of the tornado damage. I've grown up in the Midwest, I've seen tornadoes all my life, lived uh, waiting to hear the air raid sirens and head for the basement, but I've never seen anything quite as devastating as what I saw in Harrisburg. And then when I went over to Ridgeway, Illinois, about 25 miles away, I saw the local Catholic church, which had been standing for, I think, a century, collapsed when the winds hit it. It was clear to me and to the governor, many others, as we toured this site, this was going to be a federal disaster area. That 175 mile an hour wind literally lifted homes off of their slab foundations and tossed them on top of other homes. In one neighborhood in Harrisburg, I happened to see some people leaving in a truck and I stopped them and they said that the lady in the front seat actually lived in one of the houses that had been destroyed. She pointed it out to me. She got up early enough that she heard the air siren and had the good sense to hit the floor of the bathroom right before the tornado hit her home. And of course, after it hit and another home collapsed on top of it, the ceiling of her bathroom collapsed on her, but there was enough room for her to survive. And they started hearing shortly thereafter the rescuers coming in. She made it with a few scratches and bruises just across the street, one of the homes that was tossed in that home was a 22-year-old local nurse who died as a result of it. There were great efforts by first responders, terrific um, humanitarian gestures. The local coal miners, just a few miles away when they heard about the disaster, in full gear came out of the coal mines and rushed into Harrisburg to pull people out of their homes after they had collapsed. Well, we went ahead and made our application for federal disaster aid in Harrisburg, Illinois, and we were denied. In the president's home state, we were denied. Well, we thought something's wrong here. With all this damage and a tornado of this intensity, it must be wrong. So Governor Quinn sat down with local and state officials. They redrafted our application for federal assistance. It was sent to Washington, and it was denied a second time. I was stunned by it. I couldn't believe it, after having seen it, that this happened. When we went to FEMA and said, what did we miss here? People died, over 100 homes were destroyed, and it just ripped its way through Harrisburg and into Ridgeway, Illinois. What was missing here? Well, they said we have to do a calculation under the law. And one of the elements in the calculation is the population of your state. Well, this is how it turned out. The damage that happened in southern Illinois, if it had happened across the river in Indiana or in Kentucky or in Missouri, would have been a federal disaster. But because we have about 12 million people, we weren't declared a federal disaster. What's the thinking behind that? Oh, if you're from a big state, you must have a lot of resources to take care of your own problems. 
Not so. Unfortunately, the state of Illinois' state budget is virtually bankrupt. So we decided that it was time to put a bill in that took into consideration a lot of things and really did not allow this disqualification for a large state. The bill that Senator Mark Kirk and I are introducing today assigns a value to each of the six factors that are to be considered in a disaster declaration analysis. When it comes to individual assistance, help for people to rebuild their homes and pay for temporary housing, it will use the same consistent factors no matter where the disaster strikes. The population of the state, that's worth 5% of the consideration. The consideration of the concentration of damages, 20%. The amount of trauma to the disaster area, 20%. The number of special populations, such as the elderly or unemployed, 20% of the analysis. The amount of voluntary assistance in the area, 10%. And the amount of insurance coverage for the type of damage incurred, 20%. Our bill also adds a seventh consideration to FEMA's metrics, the economics of the area. Turns out that Southern Illinois is hard pressed, a lot of unemployed people, struggling economy. So we take a look at the local tax base, the median income as it compares to the state, and the poverty rate in the area that's been hard hit. It's reasonable that FEMA should take into consideration the size of your state. I don't argue with it. But it shouldn't loom large and disqualify situations which clearly deserve to be considered federal disasters. Assigning values to the factors will ensure the damage to any specific community weighs more than just the state's population. After the tornadoes hit Harrisburg and Ridgeway, the head of the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, Jonathan Munkin, worked with locals and people from FEMA in the region to determine if the state could apply for public assistance, money to help local Mayor Gregg in Harrisburg and others pay for overtime that they accrued by all the people working around the clock to help the community dig out of the destruction. What Director Monken and others discovered was that it would have been a waste of the state's times and resources to even consider applying for it. We didn't meet FEMA's threshold. Currently, FEMA multiplies the number of people in your state by $1.35 to determine the threshold of the amount of damage a state would have to be incurred to qualify for public assistance. In Illinois, that figure is $17 million. Well, Harrisburg, Ridgeway, and the surrounding communities had about $5.5 million in public assistance damage. That's a lot of loss for rural areas and small towns, but not enough to qualify for federal assistance. So we put together in this bill a standard for public assistance, money that would go to local units of government. Per capita consideration, 10%. Localized impact of the disaster, 40%. The estimated cost of assistance needed, 10%. The insurance coverage, 10%. The number of recent multiple disasters, 10%. An analysis of other federal assistance of the area, 10%. The bill would also add a seventh consideration, just as it did under individual assistance, and that is the economic circumstances of the affected area. I mentioned earlier that the elements that were brought into consideration there. I think this is a more honest and realistic approach. Today, you know, introducing this bill, I'm talking about a disaster which visited our state just a few weeks ago. Tomorrow, I say to my colleagues, it could be your state. You could find out that a devastating natural disaster does not qual qualify for federal disaster assistance simply because of the population of your state. I don't think that is a fair metric to be used. I think our approach is fair. I commend this bill to my colleagues, and as I say in closing, this last few months, it was Illinois. Tomorrow, it may be your state. Please take the time and look at this approach. I think it is fair to taxpayers. It is certainly fair to families across America. And those of us who have been in Senate and Congress for a while have stepped up time and again when our colleagues were affected by a natural disaster. I hope my colleagues will take the time to consider this legislation from Senator Kirk and myself. Before 2.15. Before that. Uh, Mr. President, I suggest the absence of quorum.
Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Acaco. 